This video will show you how to texture a stylized face. It's an overview of the process I used with detailed guidance, but it's meant for the intermediate to advanced user. Although as with most of my videos, I've tried to make this reasonably beginner friendly, you may still want to take a look at my texture painting playlist and texture baking playlist for more guidance on the topics covered. And of course, if you like what I do, then check out the playlists on this channel and my website for more great content. Now this video is sponsored by Nvidia and PC Specialist. As you probably know, Blender's performance is greatly accelerated by NVIDIA RTX GPUs, with their ray tracing cores and AI tensor cores, boosting viewport performance, denoising, rendering, and much more. NVIDIA Studio is a plan to create hardware and software that accelerates many creative apps, just like Blender, using the GPU. PC Specialist are NVIDIA Studio partners, selling a range of customizable PCs that perform great with Blender. I'm a big fan of PC Specialist and have had a great experience with their PCs. They are leading system builders, specializing in custom PCs and laptops for creators and gamers. PC Specialist sell a range of customizable PCs that are NVIDIA Studio certified, meaning the spec has been tested to meet a creator's requirements. Configure your next system using PC Specialist's online configurator and they will build, test and deliver your RTX Studio certified rig to your door. I'm using a PC Specialist PC and if you're interested you can see my PC specs on the screen here. The star of the show being the NVIDIA RTX 390 and the AMD Ryzen 9 5950X. I'm extremely happy with it, it's powerful, quiet, and I know it's been built properly with the creator in mind. So a big thanks to PC Specialist and NVIDIA for their support of this channel. So before going into the texturing process, it's important to understand that this final image is not just about the texturing process, it's about the material process in general, as there's an element of subsurface scattering, which makes up the material which gives it its look, but the lighting also plays an influential part. So if I hide the lights, you can really see the influence and the power of the lighting on our character. And when I bring them back, you can see that warmth and that glow and much more depth. I'll talk about lighting in a separate video and concentrate on texturing in this one, but do bear that in mind throughout the process. So the first thing to talk about is UV editing. So I'll take us to the UV editing workspace and I will hide all the lights. And this is what it looks like in Eevee. It's got a much more sort of flat plasticky look and you can certainly get a bit more of a feeling now about how I've textured the model. Let's select our character. I'll also hide the hair as well, just to make it easier to see what's going on. So I'll select the model and I'll go into edit mode so you can just see the UV seams. It's a really basic unwrap. So I've just sort of cut off areas to minimize stretching. And there's lots of different ways of unwrapping the head. This is just a nice simple way. It doesn't make too much difference if you are texture painting as you don't get visible seams. But what you want to try and end up with, if I select all, you can see the UV islands there and I'll maximize this space with control spacebar and zoom in a bit. It's all blue at the moment so you can see the stretching that's in the overlays and you can say display stretch and anything that's really light blue you have to worry a little bit about but nothing too major here. Maybe in that ear I think it is just there but you don't really notice this sort of stretch. So you need to make sure that your islands are as close to dark blue as possible so you haven't got too much stretch. Once I'm happy with the islands, then I need to bake from the high poly mesh to the low poly mesh. I've got a whole playlist on baking textures, which you can see here. So I'm going to run through it fairly quickly in this video. So do take a look at that for more information. I'll run through it very quickly for the sake of this video as more of a reminder and an overview for 3.0. With our low poly selected, you create a new texture. I call this face norms for normals and I'll call it face norms three so it doesn't get confused with other ones. And I make the texture size 2K. You can go to 4K, but there's no need for this particular model. I turn off the alpha because we don't need it and press OK. So there's my texture and I'm in the shader editor up here. I'll create a new material. So I'll delete this one and create a new one and call it face low poly tutorial. And we need this texture image in our material. So I'll zoom in just a touch, shift A to add, texture, image texture, bring that in and load in my face normals three. So this texture is now in my material that is attached to my low poly object. Make sure it's selected because that means it's the active image texture. Then I can select my high poly, make sure it's visible and visible in the render. I'll just show you what that looks like. Looks really strange at the moment because it's got a material on it. I'll talk about that in a moment. So there's the high poly. I'll bring back the low poly and make sure it's visible in the render. You must make sure that you select the high poly first and the low poly last. So I'm holding down control and selecting the low poly. That means the low poly version will be the active object. And you can tell it's the active object because it's highlighted yellow and that material is present here and that image 
that we need to bake to is highlighted here. Then we need to be in cycles for this. Cycles, and you can use your GPU for this because it will run fast with a good GPU. And as mentioned, I'm using the NVIDIA RTX 390. And I'll talk about how graphics cards can improve your workflow a little bit later on. Then we can scroll right down. And where it says bake, we turn that to the normal map that we want. We tick selected to active and open that disclosure. Now the extrusion is the distance between your high poly and your low poly mesh. So you can see if I zoom in that the high poly is kind of overlapping the low poly. The high poly is this sort of gray one here and the low poly is the white one. Now mine are very close together. The biggest difference between the two, that's what we're looking for, is probably around the mouth here. And you can even get your measuring tool out and assume it's about this sort of length. So very, very tiny and it's 0.005 of a meter. So we can bring this extrusion right down. And that's how far the rays from the low poly are pointing out and trying to find the high poly. So I'll press X to delete that measurement and I'm comfortable with 0.01. That's above what we measured and we can try it out and see how we get on. Max ray distance is a point not to go past. Let's say it was coming out from the low poly and this top lip and it was pointing outwards, it might hit the bottom lip which we don't want. So you can set a maximum distance that it can't go past. This all comes with experience, but hopefully that explanation helps somewhat. Once you're happy, you can then press bake. You may get an error message down here if something goes wrong, but hopefully you'll be able to figure it out from that message. And a 2K image will take a little bit of time. Now we've got a few anomalies here, these sort of orangey colors you wanna watch out for. So we could probably change our distance a little bit here. I'll just bring it up a tiny bit. My measurement was obviously a little bit short. Press bake once again and I'll just time-lapse this. And that looks like a good bake now with no orangey bits. Make sure you save that. Change the color space to non-color data. Then we need to hook this up to the normals. I'm hooking it straight in and that won't actually work. You need to shift data add, add a vector and a normal map in between. So it goes into the color from the normal to the normal. Now when I hide my high poly, you should be able to see some of that data coming across onto our low poly model. It's fairly hard to see in this particular model, but it does do a good job. And you can test what it's like by unhooking it. And you can see around the lips, the difference that it makes when I hook it up. We do exactly the same for the cavity. So I create a new image, face cav three, and press okay. I'll just duplicate this image, so shift D, and change it to face cav three. And I'll put that nearer the top because that kind of goes into the color section. Now we've got our baking set up, but what I need to do slightly differently with this is on my face high poly, Let's make that visible and I'll just hide the low poly for now. You can see I've got a setup here, which is a pointiness node. So shift data add input geometry and the pointiness is just there. We plug that into a color ramp and it's pretty much always the same. The black is about 0.4, the white you bring it down to 0.6 roughly and plug it into the base color. And that gives you this sort of shading in the cavity. You can't see it at the moment because it only works in cycles. So let's jump over to cycles now. This will take a moment because it's a high poly mesh. Again, I'm loving my NVIDIA RTX 390. But you can see that cavity in there. If I unhook it and then hook it up again, you can see that in the crevices, it's much darker and in the highlights, it's much lighter. And that can really help to give the model a bit of depth to push the low poly model to look more like a high poly model. Now what I do with the Node Wrangler installed, so that's Edit Preferences Add-ons, type in Node and tick the Node Wrangler. You can now press Control Shift left click on the color ramp that puts it into a viewer node, which is actually an emission. And that's far less glitchy when baking because we can come across here and change our bake type to emit. If you don't use the emission, you have to use the diffuse, but the emit's much easier. That will take the information from this emitter node and bake it onto our cavity texture. So once again, we select the face high poly, low poly last. Do make sure that you've got it visible in the viewport and the render. And on your face low poly, you've got the face cavity image selected. That's your active texture that you're baking to. And then just double check your bake type is emit and bake. Cue the time-lapse. This always takes a little bit longer than the normal map. And there we have our cavity map baked. Now we don't need the high poly anymore, so I can hide that. You can see if I hook the cavity up to the base color, we've got some of that darkness in the crevices now, and that will work just as well in Eevee because it works reasonably well there as well. So that's the baking process. The next is to add a new image for the color. For this, I'll take you back to my original and I'll talk you through how I painted it. So there's my normal map. I'll talk about face roughness in a moment. And here's my face cavity. And I create a new map called the face color. I put those into a mix RGB. So shift A to add color mix RGB and change the mode to overlay. Then it will look like this. You plug the face cavity into the bottom and put the factor all the way up. 
Overlay will take the light bits from this image and make this color slightly lighter and the dark bits and make this color image slightly darker. Then on our color image, this is what I've painted. Again, I've got lots of tutorials on texture painting, so I'm just gonna go through with an overview of what I did here. If you want to know how to set up for texture painting, then do check out the playlist in the description. I'll go to the texture paint workspace so you can see what's going on and obviously turn over to material preview mode. And at the moment we can see just the color and I can hold down control shift and left click between the principled BSDF and that color texture. That's the final result through the principled BSDF with the normals and the cavity, and that's just the color on its own. So I'll quickly talk through the color on its own. Obviously I've filled it in with a sort of skin tone, which was roughly around here. I'll scroll up a bit and click on that so you can see where it is in the color wheel. For areas under the chin, I made it slightly bluish, really slightly bluish. So I was over in this area in the color wheel. For these sort of areas, slightly reddish. So again, a bit more down here, a bit more warmth, and obviously pink lips. Slightly darker and more reddy under the eyes here. And at the top of the head, slightly more yellow. And that's really common when you're painting characters, especially stylized. A Little bit of blue, a bit more pinky reds across the middle here, and a bit more yellows up the top. It's quite subtle though. Looks a bit over the top at the moment, but as soon as I go to my principled BSDF, it's a bit more subtle, especially when we get the subsurface scattering in there and the final lights and render. If you type in painting faces and skin tones into Google, you can find some really good reference images and people talking through their color theory and techniques. Here's a good example, more bluey grays into the reds and then into the yellows. And you can see that's a theme throughout a lot of these images. And stylized tends to be an exaggeration of these colors. And for these tiny elements, in the stroke method, I up the spacing of my space brush. Normally that's 10%, and let's put it with a really red color, and put the jitter right up as well. You get these sort of dotty effects like this. But again, it's quite subtle with the final result. The last thing to talk about is that I painted a roughness onto my face as well. So I created a new image, and if I control shift left click on that, you can see how I've drawn that. So the darker bits, and they're not that dark, they're only a gray. And the darkest we've got is this top of the lip just here. Those are shiny because they have very little roughness. Anything that's white has a lot of roughness. So you can see the areas that I've painted a bit of shininess on, the cheeks here, the top of the nose, the lips particularly, the eyelids and the eyebrow just there, the top of the head, and just painted a little bit of that in. Those darker bits giving it a bit of shine in certain areas. The final result, as you can see when I move around, We've got a little bit of shininess in those areas, but generally keeping it quite rough, a bit more rough than normal skin. I just think that worked better. The last thing is the subsurface scattering, and I put that at 0 0.01. It's such a minor amount, you'd think it wouldn't make any difference. But if we go across the cycles now and turn my lighting on, because this is affected a lot by lighting, there it is when it's on, and there it is when it's off. A lot flatter. And with that, it just has a bit more warmth. That will increase your render time, but it's a really nice effect. So I've brought back the hair and the lights so you can see the final results. Of course, a major help in this process is having an NVIDIA RTX card. It looks really wonderful with cycles, but the subsurface scattering does increase the render times. But it also makes a massive difference to the warmth and feel of the image, so you'll want to include it. The great thing about the NVIDIA RTX cards, as I'm sure you've heard, is how they use their ray tracing and AI tensor cores to increase both the viewport feedback and the render speeds. Now it looks fast as it is at the moment, but if I take you to the render settings and under the viewport, tick on the denoiser, using the optics which is specific to the RTX card, you can see that it's almost instant. This has made a massive difference to my workflow. And I should say that this is also Blender 3 and it's Cycles X integration. And that combined with the RTX optic denoise is just incredible. And it means you can adapt things, tinker so easily and get really fast updates. Now, because I've got a powerful card, I set my start samples to five, but the default is one. And that gives you an even faster response, but you can see it's a bit blobby to start with, with that low sample start. So I just set mine to five and just allows me to not be distracted by those initial results. I still keep my samples really high and you can see that zooming away there as it's still working, but you can see it doesn't make a huge amount of difference from that initial first second. I'll keep my samples high because I want to keep the warmth of the image and having a high sample rate will help that. 
And of course you can go down to render and set the denoise in there as well. If you haven't got an RTX card, then you'll use the open image denoiser, but I'm obviously changing to optics. They've also got the passes of the albedo and the normals, and it's a good idea to render out both and see if you can see any differences. Sometimes it doesn't help that much to denoise the normal as well. What I love about Blender 3 is that we've got a time limit setting, so we can set a time limit for each frame if it's not quite reaching the sample count. And I find that really useful because I can then think about the timing of my renders rather than just be waiting around. So there we have it, the final result. In the next episode, I will talk about lighting. It'll be a shorter episode, but it does deserve an episode by itself. Thanks once again to my sponsors, PC Specialist and NVIDIA for making this process much easier. And of course, the people at Blender for all the wonderful innovations in Blender 3. It makes this type of artwork so much simpler. And thank you for watching. Hope this was helpful and I'll see you next time.